Welcome back to Mind Science, episode 37. In today's video, we're going to be looking at some of the metaphysics of self-realization and more specifically, the practice of meditating upon the I am. Now, if you follow my content at all, then you probably know that I'm a big advocate and fan of this practice. Many realized masters over the ages, such as Nisargadatta Maharaj and Sri Ramana Maharshi, would advocate this practice to their devotees of simply holding on to the sense or the feeling of I am within. And that by doing this enough over time, it would begin to take you into the heart of the self, where the self can truly become realized. Now, this is as simple and direct a spiritual practice as there is. And in fact, it's so simple and direct that most people find it to be very challenging. And there's really good reason for this. I believe that there's a few very helpful things to understand first that will allow one to truly connect with this practice. And the first place that I like to begin in explaining how this practice truly works is through what is called in the Hindu tradition, the three gunas of the mind. Now the word guna in Sanskrit basically means quality or state. And there's many different ways to think about the three gunas, but I personally like to see them as the three states of attention of the mind. And those three states are classified as the tamas guna, the rajas guna, and the sattva guna. So the best way to understand the three gunas is in using the analogy of seeing the mind as a wheel. If you picture a wheel that's rolling or spinning, the most amount of speed or inertia on the wheel is of course going to be at the circumference or the edge of the wheel. And in this analogy, inertia is likened to suffering. So as, as our attention is on objects in the mind, the faster the wheel is spinning, the more and more propensity there is for suffering to be generated. If we can use the term entropy from thermodynamics in this analogy, it becomes a lot easier to understand these three states of the mind. So entropy in thermodynamics is a term that represents the amount of chaos or the lack of order in any given system. So the tamas guna is a state of attention where the mind has very high entropy when the mind is focused upon suffering, impurities, perversions, anger, depression, fear, and things of this nature. The Rajas Guna is an object-focused mind. This is a mind that is selfish and controlling and looking towards objects for fulfillment. A man who chases after women or money or a nice car or fame or success all represent the Rajas Guna. Now, a mind that is very rajasic is not necessarily in a state of suffering. When the mind is dwelling upon objects, it may be very excited to pursue those objects, but it is moving closer towards the circumference or edge of the wheel, where the mind will inevitably become tamasic again and begin suffering. However, if we give the mind a spiritual object to focus on, such as a mantra meditation, spiritual music, chanting or prayers or meditating upon the I am feeling, the rajasic mind will begin to move closer towards the center of the wheel of the mind, where there's less and less entropy or inertia. So the state of the rajas guna can be increasing or decreasing entropy depending on what the object of focus is. And so if the mind is dwelling upon a spiritual object, eventually it will move the mind to the center of the wheel where there's less and less inertia until it reaches the very center of the wheel where there's only perfect stillness. And this center of the wheel is the sattva guna, a mind that is focused on peace, harmony, and silence. And so using this wheel analogy, we can see that attention upon objects of sense pleasures will move the rajas guna towards the tamas guna, but attention upon the self will move the rajas guna to the sattva guna. And this is where we can really begin to understand or connect with the practice of meditating upon the I am. 
So it's helpful to understand that the mind is only ever in one of these three states of attention. It's either in the tamas guna, at the circumference of the wheel, or the tire, where there's lots and lots of inertia, where the mind is focused upon suffering and anguish, depression, anger, and misery, and so forth. Or it's at the center of the wheel, in the sattva guna, where the mind is focused on peace and stillness and harmony and bliss. Or it's oscillating between the two in the rajas guna, which we might think about as the spokes of the wheel. And so here's the main difficulty that people have when trying to meditate upon the I am. The survival mind, or ego, doesn't like to be without its certainties for very long. And its certainties are essentially all of our fears and desires, all of our stories we tell ourselves, our problems, uh, the identities that we have. These are the things that the mind believes that it knows for certain. And so it wants to keep us always focusing on these objects in the mind to help us survive and move up the social ladder and all the other things that the survival mind has been programmed to focus on. So when we sit down to meditate and experience even a few moments of peace and stillness, this will typically ignite the mind to anxiety and it will start creating a lot of thought activity. And what's basically happening is the mind is saying to you, we don't have time to sit here and just be quiet and meditate and do nothing, okay? We have all of these unmet desires to go fulfill, all of these problems to work out, all these identities we got to keep protected. Okay, we don't, we don't have time to sit here and do nothing. So get up and go do something. And so here's the main key to finding breakthrough in this practice. The key lies between the difference of conceptual knowledge of the self and intuitive knowledge of the self. Most people, when they meditate upon the I am, are trying to remember all of the teachings and concepts they've learned in the books they've read, in the videos they've watched. The I am is pure consciousness. Consciousness is eternal and infinite. Yes, so okay, I'm going to think about that. I'm, I'm meditating on that. I am. I've got it. And this actually makes it very easy for the mind to just slip in a new object of thought in place of it and continually distract your attention. Because the rajasic mind or object-focused mind is not a very strong state of attention. It's easily distracted with objects. And so what we want is to be in a state of the sattva guna, of stillness and purity of mind, where we are drawn inwards towards the heart of the self. And this is where intuitive knowledge comes into play. Most people try to meditate upon the I am with conceptual knowledge alone. But the self which we are can only be known intuitively. It does not announce itself like the mind. It does not call your attention. It is always quiet and serene. It is so near to you that there's no room to see it, which is why it cannot be known with the mind. It must be felt within the heart. And so the practice of bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion, takes you into the heart, the center of the wheel, which allows you to experience the self. Only when we love the self will we truly know it. And so before taking up a practice of I am meditation, it's helpful to first begin meditating upon the nature of God. Spend time in meditation or contemplation imagining the divine energy that permeates the universe, imagining the one infinite creator that was and is and is forevermore. Think of all the love you've ever felt, all the beauty you've ever seen, and know that it is only a drop in the ocean of God's unfathomable greatness. And as you meditate on God's majesty in your imagination, Begin to feel that majesty shining within your own heart as the feeling I am. This is what Ramana Maharshi meant when he gave his personal definition for meditation. Mentally imagining oneself to be the supreme reality which shines as existence, consciousness, bliss is meditation. I is consciousness 
am is existence. Existence represents the feminine principle of God, the essence, the life force, the ground of being. Consciousness is the masculine principle, the knowing, the awareness, the understanding. And bliss is the feeling of union, wherever the masculine and feminine principles meet. It is only once I come to know I am that true happiness shines the bliss of the self. The self that we are is fathomless peace and boundless love. And once you have experienced that peace and that love, then you have created a connection to which you can contact in meditation. This is the practice of bhakti yoga, to devote one's heart unto the creator, to see, feel, and enjoy God in everything. And so pursuing knowledge alone has its own merits but only a devotional practice can deepen your intuitive knowledge of the self. Sid Harameshwar Maharaj summarized this idea beautifully when he said, the individual turns towards sense objects and in doing so, turns towards sorrow. The objects that appear to be pleasant are really unpleasant. The objects that appear attractive are actually very destructive and give pain yet the individual always runs after these objects. Therefore, stop thinking about sense objects and turn to the path of devotion. You should constantly meditate, contemplate, and let your mind dwell on the self with great love for it. One who constantly craves after sense objects is immersed in these objects. One who meditates on the self becomes the self. So once you've established a real intuitive connection with the I am through this devotional practice of love and worship of your true nature, then you have a real weapon of defense against all the onslaughts of the mind. Whenever the mind tries to drag you back into body consciousness, you just remember and connect with that place in you that knows I am the self. And in this way, the sadhana of the mind can be likened to a battlefield where the mind is always launching arrows of body consciousness at you. And if you believe yourself to be a body, then these arrows have a place to land in you and stick inside of you. But if you can simply be aware of these arrows and abide as the self that you are, it's as if you become invisible to the mind and there's nowhere for these arrows to land in you. And Ramana Maharshi told a very poignant analogy about this idea. The analogy is that of a bull in a stable. And every single day this bull goes out of the stable and into the town to try and find some grass to eat. And in the process of looking for food, this bull gets into all kinds of trouble and knocks over all of the tables and the merchants and the farmer's market. And eventually the farmer gets enough complaints about this bull that he begins to give the bull some grass inside of the stable each and every day. And at first the bull still eats the grass and goes out into the town and creates the same kinds of trouble. But after a few days and weeks of doing this, the bull slowly begins to learn, hey, I don't actually need to leave the stable because all the food and nourishment I'm looking for is right here in my home. And so the bull begins to stay quietly in the stable and finds no need to leave any longer. And this is exactly the same way that the mind works. The more we meditate upon the self with true love for it, that love energy is the signal to the mind that it's safe to lay down its weapons of defense and its anxieties and fears. And it slowly begins to learn that all of the peace and contentment and happiness it's looking for is found right here in the heart of your own being. So in summary, this is the missing key for I am meditation. You do not meditate upon I am by connecting with a concept that you've learned. I am is pure consciousness, consciousness is eternal and infinite. These are just ideas in the mind. And many people attempt to meditate in this way and wind up just doing mental gymnastics ad nauseum. So instead, 
when you meditate upon I am, you want to connect with your love for existence, your love for reality, your love for God. This is where our incorruptible divinity resides. And that divinity announces itself in the body as the feeling I am. And so over time, through this devotional practice, when you affectionately connect with the I am feeling, it becomes synonymous with connecting with love. Once you come to truly love that I am feeling within, that is when you know that the grace of the Sad Guru has truly found you. And it will continue to pull you inwards like a tractor beam. And all of your attraction to sense pleasures and the temptations of the world just begin to grow strangely dim. And something in you becomes so much more interested in the mystery of your own being. This is what the practice of I am meditation will do for you. You will become mesmerized by the miracle of your own awakeness. How is it that I have come to have this self-luminous awareness, this sentience, this beingness? Who gave it to me? Where did it come from? It's just always there, self-shining and self-luminous. It appears to have no beginning, no origin, no location. It just is. And this is what the Buddha referred to when he said, No beginning is the highest truth. It is this beginningless I am that reveals the mystery of our own self to us. So again, it is not in knowing the self as an intellectual idea, but in loving the self that we truly connect with I am. When you love the highest, everything lower begins to fall away and you remain in the center of the wheel, the sattva guna, so that even if there is activity in the mind, you can witness and observe it all from that place of unchanging stillness and peace. And once the attention is no longer seduced to move outwards towards objects and sense pleasures, once the unreal falls away and only that pure love of being remains, then you will say with absolute conviction and from direct personal experience, I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am the self.